Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you are joining this webinar. Welcome to LMU's special webinar on protection of intellectual property. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California, and also the director of Center for International Business Education. We often call the CYBE or CYBER using the acronym. Today's program is organized and co-sponsored by LMU Center for International Business Education and Fred Kiesner Center for Entrepreneurship and funded by the grants awarded by the US Department of Education. LMU is one of the 15 universities in the country that received this prestigious cyber grants award. The LMU cyber serves as regional as well as national resources to students, faculty and business practitioners by connecting community with international education, foreign language training and research capacities. As part of our mission to help improve global competitiveness of US companies and industries, LMU Cyber has been offering special lecture series on various international business topics that have significant implications for US businesses. Today's topic perfectly matches the goal of this side. In today's business world, nothing is more important than intellectual property. Companies invest enormous amount of time and effort to produce their intellectual property and create their proprietary knowledge. Intellectual property is valuable intangible asset that should be protected to enhance the company's competitive advantage in the marketplace, both domestic and global. However, it is not an easy task to accomplish. When it comes to international business, becomes much more complex and complicated due to different institutions and business environments across countries. Today, we have invited several very successful LMU alumni who have led this charge at their respective companies in this endeavor. I can't wait to listen to these panelists about their experiences and insights on how they've been able to meet challenges in protecting intellectual property rights. Now, before we start the program, I'd like to ask Dr. Dale Smith, the Dean of College of Business Administration, to say a few words to welcome everyone. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Professor Peck, colleagues, students, friends of the college. On behalf of the CBA, it's certainly my pleasure to welcome you to this co-sponsored event. Um, our panelists this, this afternoon really do span the gamut in a variety of sectors, from beauty to aircraft manufacturing, from entertainment to law. In short, the topic of IP is one where everyone is at stake. By way of opening remarks, I'd, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to highlight the importance of the issues we'll discuss this afternoon. And I'm reminded of a personal story that drives home just how complex the issue of copycatting and IP rights might be. Now, as a young teenager, I remember a couple of friends and me creating a new look for footwear, something we thought was unique and could get others changing the way they wore sneakers or tennis shoes to middle school. Now, some more artistic peers copied the idea and we were left not receiving credit or benefiting from the popularity competition so vitally important in a preteen's life. I remember going home and crying about it. After all, it was my idea. And my mom at the time said, Dale, don't you know that copycats are the highest form of flattery? Well, while she may have helped me deal with self-esteem issues, I can't help but do some retrospective sense-making and think that the economic impact, had I cared about entrepreneurial initiative then, would have been a real loss to me. It's good to know that I've grown up since then and I care far less about being popular. But as a business professor and dean, I know the issues can be complex and copied cats can have drastic financial implications. While in memories of my time living in Asia, I laughed at a picture I took, a photo that I took at the silk market in Beijing. There was this sign high above the open market that said, we respect intellectual property rights. And just below that sign on the market floor was a rack of Dolce & Gabbana leather jackets priced for what amounted to 20 US dollars in RMB. I have to wonder, where do you draw the line around affordability and access? So the big questions that I think we'll be discussing this afternoon is does IP and copyright law stifle innovation? Is there a role for open source and sharing IP? And is there a role for the copycat? For example, when an engineer at Volvo invented the three-point seat belt back in 1959 to save lives, the company ended up sharing the patent, 
so that any car manufacturer could use it in their design. They had decided that the invention was so significant that it had more value as a life-saving device, and now every car manufactured today across the globe uses that three-point seatbelt. And there's other examples. But I'm also reminded of the work of a contemporary artist, Shepard Ferry. He was the founder of a company, an entrepreneur, founder of a company called Obey Clothing, somebody who emerged from the skateboarding scene. And he was also known for his originality in his work in marketing and design, and the development of high impact marketing. And in speaking to the importance of IP and the entrepreneurial mind, he argued that the most important thing about intellectual property versus creative expression is that copyright law was actually created not to stifle creativity, but to encourage it. And innovation requires creativity, and we certainly want to facilitate the kind of entrepreneurial mindset that brings exciting innovation to the global community, hopefully in creating the kind of value that demonstrates business for good principles. But if we want to encourage innovation, we have to respect that there are important legal, economic, and cultural issues that should be explored. And I know this afternoon's panel will share their expertise, their concerns, and their recommendations for how we operate in a rapidly changing world. Because in some ways, this should be a no-brainer dialogue, right? And I'm sure David will ask those key questions that'll have us thinking. We know that it's not morally appropriate to steal someone's ideas. And we would all likely agree that there's a difference between amplifying someone's work and tweaking innovation to build better and then downright theft. British labor economist Guy Standing has argued that the IP system is an artificial construct that rewards owners of intellectual property, it grants the monopolies over invention and ideas that he believed in many cases are the product of generations of thinkers or publicly funded research. Do we agree with that? Or was Bill Gates right when he shared that IP is the shelf life of a banana? Or do we buy into an idea expressed by former political leader and scientist Germany's Angela Merkel that we have a duty to protect our economy and the protection of IP is a key variable in economic development. So where do you draw the line? How do we build onto those great ideas? What's the role of private ownership versus open source and how do you balance all this stuff? I know I'm certainly excited about this panel discussion and I look forward to listening to our panelists address this very complex area that seems to be getting even more complex given technology and a rapidly changing world. Back to you, Yang Song. Okay, thank you, Dr. Smith, for your welcome remarks and sharing your own experiences and perspectives about the protection of IPR and its impact on innovation. Okay, now I'd like to introduce the moderator who will lead the discussion with the panelists, Dr. David Choi. He's LMU Connor Hilton, Chair of Entrepreneurship and Professor of Entrepreneurship and Director of the Fred Kisner Center for Entrepreneurship. He has taught both undergrad and MBA courses in entrepreneurship and technology management at LMU since 2003. Dr. Choi is a recipient of 2019 LMU Fritz Burns Distinguished Teaching Award. And also he received an award and winner of the Innovative Pedagogy uh, from the U US Association for Small Business and Entrepreneurship. He's a co-author of book titled The Values Centered Entrepreneurs. He also published a number of articles in top management and entrepreneurship journals. Before he joined LMU, Dr. Choi worked with the Boston Consulting Group, Harvard Business School, Diamond Technology Partners, Titan Corporation, and several startups. David, now I'd like to turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pack. Hello, I'm David Choi, Hilton Chair of Entrepreneurship at LMU. It's, an, it's my honor and pleasure to lead a discussion on IP on behalf of Center for International Business and Fred Kiesel Center for Entrepreneurship. This session will be a little bit different from most sessions or lectures on intellectual property. First, we'll discuss topics that are fundamental and relevant to entrepreneurs and corporations on how to develop, protect, fight for, defend IP. Second, the session would also be different because of our incredible panel today. We'll have a prolific IP attorney and three entrepreneurs from vastly different industries who will share their experiences and strategies for dealing with IP issues. 
they are all LMU alumni, which makes it especially more interesting and fun. I'll start off with some questions and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So everybody get ready. We hope that this session will be really useful for innovators of all kinds, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe even aspiring IP attorneys, which is, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. So like I said before, we have some incredible panelists today. Let's uh, open up our cameras, panelists, and, and uh, reveal ourselves to the audience. And uh, if we could maybe introduce ourselves, maybe each of us, uh, one after the other. Let's start with uh, Faustina. Thank you, David, and hello to everybody. Um, I'm so excited to be here, and it's an honor to be speaking with the community today. Um, I am an alum of LMU. I graduated in 2006 with the, my degree in electrical engineering. And following um, uh, my undergrad, I went to law school at USC and I have been practicing as an intellectual property attorney ever since. All right, and you've helped us out in the past with your expertise, so thank you for joining. Um, by the way, I always a great experience with my with our own electrical engineering graduates over the years. Uh, they become great entrepreneurs, great resources. So I love that major. Uh, Letty, one of my former favorite students. Hi everyone, thank you as well. It's an honor to be here, and I hope I can share some information that'll be helpful or inspiring for others. My name is Leti Calvo. I graduated in 2014 from the EMBA program, where I actually started uh, my company, Veramona, where I invented the very first instant brush cleaner, this little tool here that has brought me lots of joy and also lots of problems with intellectual. <laughs> so, I can't wait to share with you guys what this is all about. And thank you so much for having me. You know, I knew Letty was a great student and really entrepreneurial person. I didn't know she was going to go on to develop so many different interesting products. I didn't know she was such a great inventor. So, uh, uh, you know, really proud of her and uh, really excited to share her um, experience at, of joys and headaches that uh, you just mentioned. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Stephen. Steve Murphy, CEO of Boom Entertainment. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, Steve Murphy, I'm co-founder and CEO of Boom Entertainment. Um, we're a business-to-business -business technology company that creates sports betting and casino products for professional sports leagues and media companies and casinos. Uh, I graduated from LMU 2007, a Bachelor of Arts with a political science major. And then you went on to do your MBA at Stanford and eventually started this company. And last year, you raised a lots of money, right? Uh, we've raised $25 million so far. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, Matt, probably the most entrepreneurial person's <laughs> person specimen on the planet. Uh, Matt, please uh, introduce yourself. Thanks. Um, I got a little video going in the background. I'm, I'm CEO <laughs> of uh, a new aircraft company. Uh, well, four years old now, but uh, we invented this new aircraft with the folding wings. It's a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, which is pretty cool. And um, it folds and unfolds its uh, wings in flight so it can fly more efficiently than other VTOL designs. Um, fly further, fly longer, carry heavier payloads, use less energy, which is really important as we think about moving to advanced air mobility for uh, everything from Amazon packages to air taxis and cargo transport, military applications and whatnot. Um, I graduated, I feel very old now. I graduated in LMU in 89, undergraduate, uh, never did go to MBA school. And um, been involved, like Dr. Choi said, in a, in a bunch of different ventures. Um, this by far though, I think is the, the biggest and most exciting. Um, we're growing quickly and getting a lot of traction in the marketplace. So it's super exciting. And as Dr. Choi mentioned, IP is, is central to our, the moat around our business. If we didn't have um, protections around this, you know, we would, we would just get knocked off. And, um, and so that's, we're, we're very, sensitive to that probably foreign governments and other companies are are constantly trying to break into our data system so there's a whole it component to ip production here as well as well as uh, i'll share 
also a, a licensing strategy that that actually has a, an important IP defense component to it. So I'm really happy to, to be here and share my stories with you all. So audience, as you can tell, we've got different industries we presented, different kind of issues, different kind of IPs. Some industries very important, this IP stuff. Some industries, eh, not so great important, mm -hmm. but that's all relevant to all the students here and all the audience members listening who are aspiring entrepreneurs or uh, professionals. So um, let's start with Faustina. Faustina, could you warm us up by introducing us to maybe some fundamentals that maybe every entrepreneur or, or corporate professional should kind of know about? What kind of IPs are there? What are some basic fundamentals you can share maybe over five minutes or so? Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Um, when, when we think about IP, there's sort of a lot of different tools in the toolbox in terms of how you can protect a particular aspect of your business. There are four main areas uh, within IP law uh, that we typically talk about. There's patents, trade secrets, trademarks, and copyrights. And each one of those areas protects sort of a different component um, and has different rights attached to it. So um, for patents, for example, that would protect um, any sort of invention um, that a company has created. Um, and it would provide sort of a monopoly, you may have heard from the beginning, um, introductory remarks over that invention for a period of time. Um, so that's one area of law. Um, trade secrets is another somewhat related area. I think most ideas that become patents start off as a trade secret. Um, it's anything that sort of derives value from not being known to the public. So it could be an invention. It may be something not necessarily technology related like uh, customer lists or financial data. Uh, that type of information could qualify as a trade secret if it has value from not being known. But in order to protect a trade secret, you have to take certain steps, of course, to keep the information secret. Um, and then there are uh, trademarks, which is something that I think most people are familiar with, the, the brand names, um, anything that is used to designate the source of a product um, and associate that source with the person or the entity providing the product. Um, so logos, brand names, product names, even things like slogans, those would all fall under the category of trademarks. And there are some other aspects to trademarks too. There's um, something called trade dress, which might protect the appearance um, of a product as well. And that all gets kind of categorized um, under the umbrella of trademarks. Um, and then lastly, copyrights. Copyrights protects um, any sort of original work of authorship. So it might be uh, audiovisual content, for example, or a literary work, or um, a photo or an image. Um, things like computer program code could be copyrightable as well. Um, so the what we typically do is we kind of look at all these different areas and when we work with clients to protect their intellectual property, we do an assessment and we figure out, are there some overlapping areas perhaps where these different areas of law might come together to protect a particular product? So, um, you know, in the case of maybe a consumer product or, or a cosmetic product, for example, there might be the brand name associated with it that you would protect via trademark. There may be some inventive aspect to it, as Letty was talking about her product, um, and you might want to protect the, the functionality of the product with a utility patent. Um, there may be something unique to the way the product looks, and you could protect um, that via a design patent, for example. Um, you might have some marketing content that you've created um, as well, and that could be protected by copyright. So there are different ways to kind of layer protections um, to protect you know, whatever it is that you have created and whatever it is that you feel makes your business competitive and, and novel in the marketplace. So that's just a brief Cliff's Notes version of the different areas of IP law, and hopefully that will help inform some of the discussion as we talk today. Yeah, thank you very much. So just as a review for everybody, patent, trademark, trade secret, and copyright. Uh, the, the four major types of IP that we may be discussing. You know, for any student wanting to start a company, um, let's start with patent search. So let's say uh, a student says, 
comes up with a new invention, new idea for invention. Let's say they go to the gym, they, they think of a new exercise equipment that they, uh, can maybe build. They might say, well, I have never seen this before, so I'm sure <laughs> I can start a company around this idea. What's the danger there? Well, the danger there is that um, they haven't completed an exhaustive search. And I think nine times out of 10, when we work with um, a client, you know, they haven't seen anything similar. Um, and that doesn't mean that, that their product or their invention isn't novel. It just means that there may be more similar um, uh, products or, or inventions or even technical disclosures out there that they're not aware of. So um, searching is one way to kind of identify what else has been done and whether you know, this product or idea has merit and, and would potentially be patentable. So yeah. a search can be done um, in advance and it would identify anything that has previously been created and disclosed um, in technical literature or maybe online product marketing um, that is similar to whatever the idea is. So it may be, first of all, they might have to do some kind of search, patent search, to see if somebody already filed a patent on an idea that's very similar to what they're thinking about. And then also to be able to patent it later, they need to find out that this is actually a novel idea. Somebody hasn't already uh, tried to do something with ideas similar to it, like, or publish an article around it. Yeah, right. there are generally two hurdles, at least um, in the US, um, for obtaining a patent. It has, your, your invention has to be novel, meaning it hasn't been uh, done before all the different features of your invention that you're claiming. And it needs to be non-obvious as well, meaning maybe there isn't a product um, or disclosure out there that covers every feature, but perhaps there are two or three or more that it would be obvious to combine them in such a ways to arrive at whatever the invention is. So those are the two substantive um, requirements or criteria in order to get a patent. So having a sense of what the landscape looks like um, at least allows you to anticipate what some of those uh, other disclosures might look like. Okay, another common question for aspiring entrepreneurs. Many of our students are really good with coming up cool names of products and businesses, some of which might not have you know, certain, uh, might be have weird spellings you know, of an existing word and looks really cool. And they start a business with that name or start a product with that name. And then they find out, they might even do trademark search initially and they find out there's nothing exactly like this, okay, in database. So I must be able to get a trademark. One, these are not infringing on somebody else's trademark. And they start the business with a certain name and then boom, they get a letter. Hey, you're infringing on my trademark. And you go, but this is not the exact same spelling, right? What, what, what happened there? Yeah, so I think that's a very common um, issue to run into in, in terms of trademarks. Um, this, the legal standard for trademark infringement is confusing similarity. So it doesn't require that there be an exact identity between the, the two marks. Um, there has to be a confusing similarity. So the, the policy behind trademark law is to protect consumers from being confused, not necessarily to protect the brand owners per se, but would a consumer who sees that uh, trademark as applied to a particular product or service, would they believe that that could possibly be associated with or that product or service provided by a different um, source? And so confusing similarity is, is a very nuanced um, determination in some cases where you have two marks that they're not exactly the same, but they're certain features that are different and the question is, are those differences enough to dispel any confusion? So not finding an exact match doesn't necessarily give you the all clear to use a trademark. Yep, okay. Another common thing that happens with my students, um, they, they get a domain, something xyz.co. So they think, oh, I must be able to use this name now I cannot be infringing on anybody's trademark because I've got xyz.co that was given to me on GoDaddy, right? Yeah. Well, what happened there? Well, the, the problem there is that the registrars don't 
necessarily tell you <laughs> if a if a name is infringing or not, even mm -hmm. if it's available. So um, the availability of the domain name is not the same thing as as having clearance to use a certain term. Trademark law and domain names are sort of related, but they're not the same. So just because you, you've registered an available domain name doesn't mean that you have rights associated with it. Um, and there could always be a, a senior user of that same mark or a confusingly similar mark who comes around and, and finds that, you, that you've infringed um, their trademark by registering the domain name. And you know, if you're using it to provide um, related products or something of that nature, then you're certainly going to probably get a letter um, <laughs> in that instance. So um, that's why a trademark clearance at the outset is a really important tool. And typically we would search not only other registered trademarks, but also things like domain names um, to see what else has been um, used and what may be available and, and where, you know, there, there may be some, uh, a clear path to use your, your mark. Good. So all students, just because you have a domain doesn't mean you have a trademark or you can, you can use it freely. You have to do another level of check. Before we move on to uh, Letty, one last question, sort of on um, international or sort of a, a, a philosophical question around IP. When inventors, especially in the U.S., come up with a patent or copyright for software and they make it, you know, publish it, make it available, Aren't you in, in some ways just allowing competitors in all these other countries copy or at least know exactly what you do, right? Isn't there, isn't there danger to that in terms of competitiveness? Well, there's always a trade-off, um, especially when it comes to patents, for example. When you file a patent application, it's typically, unless you file a non-publication request, typically your application will be published. Mm -hmm. um, within 18 months from filing. And so the, the trade-off that's built in there is that you've agreed that you will allow the patent office to publish your application. And so that information is shared with the public and exchange, um, assuming you get the patent at the end of that whole process, you're granted a monopoly for the term of the patent, which is usually 20 years from filing. Um, and, and you get to exploit that idea for that period of time. So there is a certain trade-off in that publication does mean that the, the idea is, is then disclosed and others can see sort of the details um, of, your, of your technical disclosure. Um, but at the same time, you, you get patent rights um, in exchange for that. So there's a, a, an analysis that has to be done as to whether that's the best way. And, and so in some instances, you know, for example, software companies may prefer to keep their um, inventions as trade secrets rather than uh, disclosed through the patent filing process. So it, it's very fact specific, um, which option makes the most sense for a company. And in, in terms of software innovation, for example, it may not make sense to wait for the whole patent process to get a patent granted. Um, and you know that 20 years of exclusivity may not buy you much if your product is constantly changing and you're updating. Um, all the time. So it, it just sort of depends on what makes most business sense um, for a particular invention. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Faustina. Let's move to Letty. Letty, you in the consumer goods, beauty goods uh, product or industry. Yes. And you're also in an industry where I think products are copied all the time, uh, or they either get copied straight out or they do very similar things. So what are you doing in terms of protecting your intellectual property? What are the different things you're doing? Do you have patents? Do you have trademarks? What are you, what are you doing? So when, we, when I initially invented uh, the color switch, uh, just like Faustina mentioned, it, it was novel, but it was obvious to where you had two products um, that you could put together. And so we were advised by a couple of, of IP lawyers not to pursue a patent. Uh, so we didn't patent it, but I did name it Color Switch, which eventually kind of became synonymous with the product. And as um, companies started to copy us, uh, a couple of them, uh, very large companies, also copied our trademark, Color Switch, because they just thought it was what people called it. But no, it was the name that we initially gave it, 
But now when you saw the product out there, everyone called it a color switch. And uh, we are actually, uh, you know, uh, suing both companies right now, very large companies, um, probably going to settle with one of them very soon. And uh, so I've trademarked most of my products and product names are our brand name. And now we have a, a new product that's also very innovative. That's a hair tool and that we are in the process of obtaining a patent for it. So, um, uh, I mean, I preach always to obtain a trademark, especially if you have something very unique, um, because if the big guys come for you and they not only copy your product, but also name it, <laughs> take your name away, then, then you have something to fight back with. So it's been very, very helpful for us. So everybody, this is real. <laughs> this really happened. You really need to protect yourself. Um, so, but it, it, it is amazing to hear that, you know, two large companies, I don't know what happened, what they were thinking. Uh, maybe they were overzealous, uh, you know, to, to get market share or, or to get revenue and somebody didn't manage somebody. But um, how, do you, how do you explain uh, this could have happened? Uh, that, that a large U.S. company, you think maybe Americans followed law a little bit, uh, uh, you know, infringed on your trademark. I mean, it could be one of two things. They, they <coughs> have, one of the companies actually we were in talks with to uh, work out some type of deal uh, where they they were they were going to sell the product, uh, but it was going to be a collaboration. So they, when we gave them price points, they could have thought that it was more expensive than what they wanted to pay for it and just skip right over us uh, so that it, it could have been that they just dismissed us or two uh, whoever was in product development didn't do the due diligence their due diligence to check on the trademark uh, and just decided to to use it one of, one of the companies actually told us that the manufacturer suggested the trademark name and they just went with it so that was really interesting <laughs> <laughs> they either uh, didn't do the homework or they were evil. I don't know. Either way. Either way. Right. So, and then the, the, <laughs> they skipped through us. They went, you know, directly to the manufacturer uh, overseas and the manufacturer presented the design, presented the name, and they went with it. So never checking to see if it was our name, which it was. It was all on email threads. So just it happens. Yeah. So you know. If you have trademark, if you patent, that's one thing, but you got to be willing to protect it and, and, and fight for it. So how did you go about the process of finding an attorney and, and going through the process? Well, what, what happened there? Well, I, I spoke to a few different attorneys and, and just the one that I felt the most comfortable with, I, I went ahead with, and uh, she's been our, our lawyer ever, ever since. And she's very accessible. I can text her when I find something online when I see a picture of a product that's questionable using our name and very quick to respond and, and let me know it's something we can move forward with. But, you know, with, with very large companies, it's, you know, I get an immediate, yes, we're, we're moving forward. But when it's a very small company on Amazon, of course, that's copied us, you know, a hundred times, um, a thousand times at this point, um, then it's something that's very diff difficult to pursue. But, you know, we have a really good lawyer behind us and very, very helpful. And I trust her. So that's really important. Yeah, you must have a good attorney who's not afraid to sue or, you know, confront big companies. But on what you just said about small companies, maybe you're able to sue these companies because they're U.S. companies. If they were copycats from overseas, it's kind of hard to sue those guys and go after them, right? Right. We, we've never tried to do that, even though we have been copied, you know, all in every, every country of the world at this point, and even by retailers that we work with, uh, they just go about it in a way where it's legal. They don't use our trademark name. So there isn't really much that we can do, uh, but, but it is out there in different countries for sure. Before we move on, I know that you also fought for your <coughs> um, <coughs> product in the most interesting way. You fought against your copycats in one of the most interesting ways I've heard when you were talking to uh, big box retailers, right? When another company went to sell your invention to a big box retailer, you kind of got in the way. Could you explain, uh, share that story? 
So the, when large retail, we were in Sephora very early on, which obviously spread the news about our product and other retailers and companies were able to then go ahead and copy us because they knew it was a product that sold well. Um, so when we noticed that we, you know, it was hurting our business, obviously, uh, I started reaching out to retailers that copied us and really just went about it in a very human way, explained my story. Uh, I went to, um, to conferences where I actually was able to meet face to face and really tell them, listen, I know you already, you already have a copy of our product. You sell it. I've seen it in your stores. I'm not upset at you. I understand how this works, but I want to let you know that I'm actually the original inventor of this product. It started in a classroom uh, as I was obtaining my MBA, as I was you know, working seven days a week and going to school and this is my baby and it's hurt our business. And if you don't have to start, stop selling the copycat, but give us an opportunity to sell the original one in your stores. And it actually has worked with two very large retailers and now they're, they're our biggest customers. So it, it never think that you're, you're not a humanly phone call away from, from obtaining the business just by explaining your story. Great, great story. Never be afraid to call people. <laughs> and by the way, that's one of the most entrepreneurial ways to fight for your, uh, for your business uh, against copycats. And I bet you no IP strategy textbook has that, that method <laughs> in any of the chapters. So, and, and, and I still have a few of those retailers on my list, so I, I, I won't stop. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. Let's move to uh, Steve. Steve, a boom entertainment. So Steve, I know your situation and perspective can be a little bit different because you're in a different industry uh, in consumer tech. Uh, first of all, what kind of uh, IP do you have and what kind of IPs do you protect? Sure, so we are game creators. So we create gaming products, um, everything from free to play products to real money products. Um, that live inside apps that we that we operate on behalf of our partners. Um, so platforms, um, specific games, IP, um, trademarks of those games are all some of the things that that we deal with on an intellectual property basis. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think you know I probably have the opinion that for most what I would call consumer facing software companies, um, especially in your early days, I don't think IP protection should keep you up at night as much as, you know, retail products and, and you know, my fellow entrepreneurs here. Um, I think their businesses, IP is, is very critical. Um, and so I, I think in some businesses, it's, it's very valuable. In others, it's less so. Um, I liked the, the quote in the, in the intro about how IP, IP has the, oh, sorry, motorcycle outside. Uh, IP has the shelf life of a banana. I thought it was a pretty good quote. Um, for like, for software and tech, I mean, it's often like that, right? It's things change rapidly and quickly. And especially when you're creating consumer products where you're measured by how many active users you have, what the revenue of, of your, your LTV of players are. Um, you know, I'm more of the opinion that most ideas are worthless. It's really about the execution of those ideas. Uh -huh. So I think actually too many startup founders are too protective of their IP and ideas. Uh -huh. And they would be better served if they told more people about them because they would refine their ideas. They would get expert opinions. They would find all the companies that tried that idea that it didn't work. Um, so I think that you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. And I think in some ways uh, for, for a lot of startups, you need to be careful about being too protective. That's a very good point. By the way, many of our students work on consumer technology kind of products. So this is actually very relevant. Um, I know that, you know, when I watch Shark Tank and some consumer good companies or consumer tech companies say, oh, I've got these patents. I know Mark Cuban usually just rolls his eye. Like, uh, okay, whatever, right? He kind of doesn't like it. And I, I think that's kind of what you're saying. And by the way, <clears throat> what you just said that about people, that people should disclose their ideas, share their ideas and talk to people about the ideas. And I know that, you know, I think most entrepreneurs kind of, you know, are kind of good at it, but a lot of, you know, inventor types are very hesitant to share any of the ideas to anybody. And as a result, maybe they don't get as far as they should. 
So, you know, in, I think the general rule for entrepreneurs should be, if you have an idea, you know, share the idea with people, get feedback and, 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 and move forward. Except I bet, uh, Faustina, there, there must be some things you, you do need to watch out. If you do want to get patents or something like that, you can't just disclose it everywhere, right? What do you have to watch out? Well, if you do have patents sort of in mind for the future, you have to watch out for the timing. Um, if you disclose an idea, you generally have a year of a grace period um, within which you can file a patent application. Any disclosures more than a year prior could bar you from actually getting patent protection. So we generally caution that if you are going to share, just be mindful of your the timing of your patent strategy, if that's the, the route that you want to go down. There are other uh, mechanisms too, like NDA um, agreements, things like that. But um, generally, if you have patent in mind, it's it's good to file early if you can. But this probably, a patenting doesn't probably apply too much to consumer you know, softwares, apps, all there are some exceptions. Uh, but if you do want a patent, you got to watch out what you're doing. You got to, the moment you start disclosing, you got about a 12 months period. Mm -hmm. um, what happens like when you want to share your idea to, let's say, angel groups, investor groups? Um, Dr. Troy, could I just yeah. add one thing to that point? Because yeah. I, I think what's really interesting about, you know, there, there's filing a provisional patent and then filing a full patent. And there's a way to kind of put your foot foot in the door without committing to to um you start you know a, a priority date and you and but you don't have to incur the time and expense of filing the full patent but you still begin your protection at that point maybe Faustina, you want to point that out yeah definitely and um, so there's sort of two flavors of utility patent application there's the provisional patent application which is is more of a placeholder it won't actually ever mature into a patent um, but it will get you your filing date early and it allows you to say patent pending once you have it on file, which is beneficial, um, especially at the early stage. And so you can file a provisional patent application. It won't be publicly um, disclosed um, by the patent office and you can do that to secure your earlier filing date. Um, and that's a nice kind of handy tool to utilize, as, as Matt was saying, be, before you even decide whether you want to commit to the full process of, of doing the full-fledged non-provisional patent application, uh, which, was, which is a much more substantive um, process, procedure. For most, you know, websites, apps, you don't, probably don't need to do a lot of patent filing, but there are certain business models that, that probably do have, you know, very strong patent protection, like like Priceline, right? Is a software website company that does have, you know, that bidding for price. That, that's a that's a. I remember that they, they patent that process. So um, even for consumer software companies, if there's something different about the business model, I think you might want to patent it, right, Faustina? Yeah, there's certainly. Um ways to patent. Software patents are a little bit tricky. There are some subject matter issues there um, as far as they're, they're sort of scrutinized more in terms of whether that's patentable subject matter. And um, so it, it's something to carefully consider. Um, it has to be a discussion, I think, with your patent attorney as to what, it, what the invention is you probably want to do some searching initially to see what else is out there that's similar. Um, but yes, it certainly can be done. And there are software companies um, who routinely file patent applications for, you know, different uh, aspects of their, their product or service. Okay, thank you. Before we move on to Matt, one last question for Steve, because um, since we're discussing some international type of issues. For your business, if you're successful in the U.S., and you already are, um, could some company overseas just for their own market, just copy exactly what you're doing and just offer it in the market? Depends on the country. Um, uh -huh. So yes, and, and just uh, to go back to the last point, just real briefly, yeah. uh, you know, we, we still file patents as well, right? I don't wanna make it sound like it's unimportant. Mm -hmm. um, I just think for, for the students who are thinking about software companies, mm -hmm. there are 50 things that will kill you in terms of your startup faster than IP protection. So focus on those 50 things first. Let this be 51, but like, you know, product market fit is more important. Mm -hmm. um, 
But in terms of international, yes, it depends on the on on the the country, right? And and, and there are various IP laws, and you know, I'm sure uh, Faustina is going to be a better uh, better person to to comment on that than, than me. Um, but often you look for for partners that can navigate those waters as well. So you know, we've, we've chatted with companies in China and Japan about you know potentially taking our games. And, you know, we know how well connected they are. We know that their distribution, we know their connections. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a path that I think we would consider taking in specific markets to help protect ourselves. Because um, it's a little bit the wild, wild west, depending on the country you're interacting with. And so as much as possible, we look to solve things with partner relations mm -hmm. um, rather than, you know, lawsuits. Yeah, so you, you, you proactively engage in business in overseas countries thereby for the future, protecting yourself, being able to expand over there. So I think that's a, that's a proactive business approach to dealing with kind of IP issues. Awesome, Matt. So um, you're basically an intellectual property company. I mean, you got great patents that protect your idea. How important are patents for, your, for the increasing the value of your business? First, I, I don't want to take credit for the idea. It's not my idea. <laughs> the, it's uh, Dr. Val Petrov, who's the, uh, the inventor of this transwing folding wing aircraft design. But um, yeah, you're right. We, we built this company around this key innovation. Um, we, I wouldn't be in the aircraft business at all if I didn't have access to this technology. I think, I think everybody else in the space are kind of focused on execution and engineering. And, um, and what we've done is, is sort of more innovation than in engineering. There's, there's nothing, nothing so remarkable about our aircraft uh, that, that you can't like figure out in 30 seconds. Like you, you see the transition, you go, oh, it's got a dihedral wing with uh, nacelles on the wing, right? And then, you, then somebody in the world could just take that idea and go, you know, duplicate it. And, um, you know, creating the flight computer is a little bit of more of a challenge than some other designs. But, right, the, all of the benefit, all the value of our company is wrapped up into being able to protect that wing fold. And so, um, you know, IP protection is just incredibly important for us. And it's the reason why sort of four years, let's see, we, we came out of stealth mode in May of, eight, uh, of 2018. So we're three and a half years uh, you know, that this has been in the public domain, so to speak. And like I said, all you have to do is watch the, the wings fold during the transition and say, I get it. I, so I can build one of those. And it, it might take a bunch of time and a little bit of money, but, um, you know, that's all you need to know to do it on your own as, as an engineering firm. So it is super critical for us. Um, so once we, once we had our patent filed, that's when we kind of came out of stealth mode. And um, a fellow uh, LMU alum, Jim Dimitriadis, who graduated a few years before I did, uh, he's got a venture firm, Kairos Ventures, and he actually, they're the, the, the largest investor in our company. And by the, by the way, I didn't even know he was an LMU alum until after <laughs> we were doing the legal docs. And funny thing, I, I looked up his name. So I was looking for an email and I searched my email and I found an email from like years and years ago. And apparently I, I attended his Hilton, his Entrepreneur of the Year, <laughs> the, the, that dinner thing. That yeah, yeah, yeah. I had one a few years earlier. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I made the connection, but um, you know, it's it's um, it's really important. Um, and I don't know. There, I have some other thoughts on this. I don't know if you want me to ramble through some of my ideas, Dr. Choi. If you want me to, yeah, sure. So. Go ahead. Well, what what other ideas do you have? Want to want to share? Sure, sure. So I mean, I one of the one of the challenges because we we make you know very different aircraft, and it really can be applied across. Tens, tens of billions, if not hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of the business. So the, 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 the current estimate I just saw today from the CEO of WISC, which is an air taxi company, is that um, analysts are pegging this as a $4 trillion opportunity by 2035. Wait, your, your opportunity? Yeah, the market. $4 trillion. Will, four trillion right, what, what they're calling, and that, that's just the air, the air taxi business. That doesn't include cargo and military and craziness. So it's very big. And because there are so many military applications, we're very concerned about um, foreign governments, you know, breaking into our, uh, you know, learning about what we're doing and getting access to our technology. So we're, we're protecting things from intellectual property, but also from information technology. So you, um, might think our, you, you, might, you might get hacked. 
Oh, I'm sure we're being, we're, I'm sure they're trying to get in right now. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, without a doubt. Um, I mean, where we host our cloud servers, you know, um, we have a, we have them hosted in certain places to protect against extradition orders in case that should ever come up. And um, we're registered with the U.S. State Department for ITAR exports. And we're, you know, when if we're part, we're partnered with a U.S. a U.K. defense company, and so they have to, you, you know, we have to have permission to say things to them and all of that. So it's kind, of, it's really interesting. But um, because we're still a very small company, and I think that we're a target um, for corporate espionage and just breaking into a stuff. Part of our IP protection strategy is to um, partner with other companies that are much bigger and better resourced than us that have a vested interest in our intellectual property. And that's, you know, licensing to, uh, you know, a $40 billion revenue company. So then in that way, or several of them really. So in that way, not only are we better able to defend a patent because they're, you know, if they're paying us $100 million a year in royalties, they, they've got a lot to protect because they've got a lot wrapped up into this, but also we become less of a target. So if we're by ourselves on a little island, you know, they're going to say, okay, yeah, yeah, we stole your idea. What are you going to do about it? We're, you know, XYZ huge company. And, but they know that we're partnered team with these other companies. So that's, that's a key part of our defensive strategy um, is, is to, to partner with companies that are very large and are better resourced than us that have a vested interest in our intellectual property also. Something else happened recently, a couple of years ago now, not quite, you know, I don't know, four or five years ago, Bastini can probably talk more about this. I'm no expert, certainly, but the United States moved from a sort of a, a, a first to invent to a first to file, you know, position. So, Believe it or not, from what I understand, you can you can have your private technology out there and just like, oh yeah, I invented this and I'm not gonna patent it, I'm just doing it. Somebody else can take your idea, patent it, and then send you a cease and desist that you've been doing for you know for some period of time. Um, and uh, and like so part of it is to prevent other people from from inter you know impacting or you know stealing your idea but part of it is just to have the right to operate and say i'm going to file this patent defensively just to ensure that i'm able to uh to go ahead and, and do this work um so those are some thoughts that i had i got more but I, i'll pause there in case you want to direct the conversation dr Choi. yeah yeah no that's excellent i remember before it was you know not based on the date of filing but who had the older lab notes Right. That's right. <laughs> Yo, hey, the mine's older. Hey, mine's. Uh, I, I worked on it uh, when you were a kid. Okay, so you know, <laughs> but yeah. uh, I, th I think you just changed that. So you you need to file patents. You need to protect your patents. You know, I spent probably a million dollars just on filing patents, not to mention protecting it in the past. But how do you know? In your case, uh, we talked about it a little briefly uh, in the past, but that your attorney or the, that your patents are good. Right, because you know, I mean, Faustina is here, but you know, mm -hmm. Faustina, you can you can add to this too. But you know, we as laymen, we don't know if the patent we we got is actually good and defensible, if they're well written by our patent attorney, or if he was uh, you know halfway asleep when he was writing. We, we don't know that. So, Matt, you got an interesting strategy on how you make sure your patents are good. Yeah, exactly. So I'll share some of that. So the, the first thing is that when you talk about filing a lot of patents, thing that people need to keep in mind is that every patent that you file has an, has an annual annuity, right? So if you have 40 patents, like you have to keep those, if you could roll those claims into one patent, or then you know th there are certain advantages of that just from a cost standpoint, because there's a cost to maintain your patents. There's no such thing as a global patent. I saw that, that question coming in the Q&A. I can't file a, a patent for earth. The closest thing I can do is file a, a PCT patent and then all the, you know, the, um, you know, the patent cooperation treaty countries, you know, makes it easier to, to prosecute. Prosecute's a weird word. It doesn't mean litigate. It just means to actually file and, and get a patent secured in a jurisdiction. You could, it's easier to, to prosecute in all those other jurisdictions that comply with the PCT um, community, including China. China's part of PCT, although whether they really honor that or not is a whole different debate. Um, and I think that I think they're doing it more and more so when you have like we have the United States um, arrested the CFO of Huawei a couple of years when they when she was in Canada. And like, you know, now there's some teeth to to, to this. And, and I think that that's heading in the right direction. 
Um, so with respect to how many patents you file and international protections and all of that, you want to, on the one hand, kind of keep your size of patent portfolio reasonable so you can afford to keep maintaining them, but you want to have them enough patenting, enough jurisdictions protected so you're generally controlling the whole world. Um, and in our space, it's a little easier because typically they, for the really big markets, it's about a billion dollars to get an aircraft certified. So if we patent in enough strategic countries, no other competitor is going to be able to successfully get funding. If like, yeah, we're not patented in Jordan. So yeah, go build an air taxi in Jordan and fly it in Jordan, but you can't sell it to France. You can't sell it to the UK, right? And, and so we, we deny their, we reduce their ability to secure financing to, for such a big project. So our, we have three granted and five pending patents and the patents are all um, in the United States and then filed in China, Japan, the European Union and Hong Kong. And so with those markets, we think that we are able to effectively generally control the global market for to protect our aircraft. But I think what you're getting at in your initial question is like sort of when we're filing the patent, how do we know that we're doing the right thing? I think choosing the right firm is, is important for, in my opinion, my, or my experience, the right thing is a firm that has like between 10 and 50 employees. I, I There are lots of great sole practitioner patent attorneys. And um, just from my experience, sort of have this mid-sized firm is the right thing where you have enough Enough of um, enough additional resources that the patent attorney who's leading that that uh, authoring the patent for you can draw on elsewhere in the firm, but it's not some massive company Gibson Dunning Crutcher or somebody that just you know some associates doing this and you got six layers and a bunch of bunch of that. The other thing is to have domain experience. So Pat, for us, an aerospace engineer, we our our patent attorney has a master's in aerospace engineering as well as a JD, so and a lot of experience. Um, doing patents in the aerospace field. But then I think what the real question is, we hire a red team. So besides having uh, the patent authoring team that's creating the patent for us, we hire a separate unrelated litigation firm, or, or in our case, one person. This person is very experienced at, at litigating and trying to defeat patents. And so they review the patent language of our patents with that view saying, how would I defeat this? How would I circumvent this? And then use that feedback to firm up uh, and strengthen the, the language and the patents themselves. And the last thing I would add on that is to try to create a patent family where you can file continuation apps over time to try to keep that patent family open. Because once it's closed, you can never add to it and you start the 20 year clock ticking. But if you can successfully continue to kind of, oh yeah, there's, you know, because the, the patent examiner will warn you. They'll say, okay, we've approved your patent. It's going to issue in, you, you got to pay $500 within 90, 45 days, whatever it is, and, and then we'll publish after that. So that basically gives you a window of opportunity to file a continuation app, which a lot to kind of keeps the patent open. And then you have another period of time uh, to, to kind of perfect that. And then before that one gets granted, you'll file another app and you kind of keep trying to do that to keep the fat patent family open. So what that allows you to do is as you continue to innovate, you can add that and strengthen that patent family. And also if you see competitors doing a tweak here or something there to circumvent, you can try to tuck that into your patent to strengthen it and inoculate you against those innovations. Faustina, Matt sounds like a patent attorney. What, what do you think about it? He does. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think that's a fantastic strategy. Um, and it very much follows, I think, what we counsel our clients to do is um, look at the different aspects of the invention, try to file a really good disclosure, of course, that is kind of wide ranging. And you don't necessarily have to have actually implemented some of the features, but if you have them in mind and you have a sense of how you would um, actually build that into the into the product. Um, it's good to describe it in the patent application because that gives you the opportunity, hopefully down the road, when you want to exploit that piece of the disclosure to do so um, by filing continuation applications. And I think the foreign strategy is an important piece as well. Um, it, it's, it's kind of implicit, but just for those who are not aware, who are listening, um, IP rights are very much territorial. They're, they're jurisdictional rights. So if you get a patent in the U.S., it protects your invention here in terms of preventing anyone here in the U.S. from making, using, selling, offering to sell, importing um, that invention. But if you have some someone else doing any of those activities in a different country, it wouldn't be 
um, you wouldn't be able to stop them just based on your US patent. So it's important to keep in mind um, a global strategy to the extent that that's part of the business plan um, as well. So everything Matt covered is, those are all good practices um, and things to keep in mind. All right, one last question from me for a while, and then we're gonna to go to questions from the audience. So uh, let's, one last question from Matt. So you do file patents here and there. There are probably some things you don't file that, that are important to your uh, way of doing business. What, what are some of those kind of things that you don't file? So we actually, um, the, 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 mainly the flight controls, um, the, the mathematics between the flight controls for our transitional phases, we have four phases of flight, kind of take, you know, or really three, takeoff, cruise, and landing. And then in between takeoff and cruise and cruise and, and landing, there's two more phases for the transition, inbound and outbound transition. So there's a lot of math in there. And it's not the kind of math that you can just sit, sit down and look at your, at your computer and do. It's math that involves simulator flight testing, real world flight testing, um, crashing aircraft. I mean, like it's, it's, it's stuff that takes time. And so the, the, the fruit of that labor are, are, you know, manifested in the, in the um, flight controls themselves. How do you control ailerons, rudder vaders, and at different wind speeds and different phases of flight. So all of that we have, we have opted to, um, you know, maintain as a trade secret. And um, even though our, our, one of our patent applications is on the flight control technology, but it's not on the gains controlling, if you will, like, like the actual, the, the math behind it, but it's the methodology of how you control a transwing designed aircraft using flight computers. And, and because it's like a helicopter or any rotorcraft controls its attitude or its pitch pawn roll, pitch yawn roll through, you know, basically different speeds and angles of, of, um, of the blades in different configurations. And a multi-rotor is similar, but an airplane is very different. It uses control surfaces, rudders, elevators, uh, ailerons, and, and other different things. So how you marry that all together in, a, in an aircraft like ours is very different. And that's actually, it's, it's a good example of why I think we'll have a real fruitful opportunity for filing patents because there's so many things that we'll be patenting that just are not relevant for another aircraft. No one at Boeing is gonna, gonna, you know, patent an outbound transwing transition because they don't do transwing transitions. So, you know, or, or the wing joint, how we have a dihedral wing joint and our, how our articulation mechanism works because they don't articulate the wings. So there's this whole opportunity to, uh, to do that. I'm not sure I answered your question. I may have oh, jumped it, on it. Makes sense. It, it makes sense. It makes for somebody trying to copy what you're doing. That spent actually a little effort without knowing these, this this uh, this math. They have to develop their own, and uh, they'll have to uh, sweat a little to really copy exactly what you're doing. So uh, that that will slow things down, and uh, totally makes sense not to patent certain things and patent certain things for uh, any 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 company. Um, let me go some to some questions. Here. Number one here. When does a company usually transition from trade secret to patent? Um, Faustina, do you want to take that? Well, I think it's dictated by, I think, the business strategy. Um, and you may not take it to, to, to patent. You may not, right. Like, uh, like Steve was saying, there are some you know, software companies where that's really not worthwhile to do. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that because they're changing so quickly and um, you know the patent process can take two to three years um, on average to get um, an indication of allowance so it's a it's an investment of time um, so that's something to consider you know your product may be obsolete by the time you get a patent for it so um, it, it wouldn't have made sense in that instance but um, it's it's really dependent on on, on the business. Um, when you file a patent application, you have to have enough disclosure in there that it's technically enabling. So you can't just put down kind of an, a, a pie in the sky idea without having any sense of how you're actually gonna implement that technically. Um, so you have to at least make sure that you know uh, from a technical perspective, what you would do to enable that invention to be, to be implemented. Um, but that's okay. it's, it's sort of the, the minimum requirement for when something would be ready for a pen application. But whether it's 
the best time or an advisable time is, is really up to the business. Awesome. I think we kind of said this might be difficult, but how can a U.S. company prevent overseas companies? We talked about this while discussing Levy, Levy situation. Overseas companies making actually unrelated product categories. Okay. Anyway, from using U.S. companies' logo and name. I remember when I went to China, like in 2000, 2005, whatever, I thought I saw a Starbucks sign in front of a coffee shop. Look very similar. Of course, it wasn't Starbucks at all. Um, I guess Starbucks probably had some pull and was able to probably do it, but other companies probably couldn't, couldn't have done it, right? Couldn't have done anything about it. The Starbucks is a famous brand, so I'm sure they've got um, Influence. registrations yeah. and, and things like that overseas. Um, yeah. if, if you don't have any sort of trademarks filed overseas, it can be difficult. Um, especially if I think the hypothetical was unrelated products or services. So if there really no, is no confusion, um, you know, the, it, it's hard to kind of posit what you might do to prevent mm -hmm. that use. Famous brands, um, at least in the U.S., if somebody is using that trademark for an unrelated product or service, there's still a claim under trademark law called dilution, where they're diluting kind of the the fame and the, the image um, of the brand by using it for something that's unrelated. Um, but again, it's it's very territorial. So you would need to look at options um, in other countries for protecting your mark there. If you're not really using your trademark there in any way, I think that's gonna be a hard uphill battle. Um, if you are using the trademark, there may be something called common law rights, where even if it's not registered, you may have yeah. rights by virtue of just having used it in commerce there. Um, but again, every region has their own trademark laws. So you'd have to get local counsel probably to, to help you enforce. This is a question from Thomas, but maybe to the entire audience. Um, of course, we know USPTO.gov is a website for patents and trademarks and stuff like that. Has anybody used any other resource for search for patents or trademarks or find answers around patents and trademarks? Google. Google has a good patent search, you know, system. In, oh. in the day. Yep. Google patents. That's interesting. I haven't actually used that too much because I haven't used them. I haven't used, I haven't done IP search in about six years. So I, that wasn't uh, as good then. Yeah, I do the same with any trade, new trademark that I want to submit. I Google and I go to shopping, um, to the category of shopping, just to make sure there's an, a product out there that's similar with the same name. So that's, that's really important that you spend a lot of time doing that. Lady, when you, do, when you file for trademarks, do you do it yourself or do you use an attorney? I have done it myself uh, the last few. <laughs> So I think I'm an expert now. I'm I'm probably not, uh, but I, I have I have been granted granted the last two, but the previous two to that were with our with our lawyers. Yes. Oh, good, good. You never got a rejection. Uh yes. One okay. was one was rejected. So this is an interesting story too. One was rejected for a, a beauty brand that I was going to start for cosmetics, and because the name was very similar to another company that sold similar products. And I was actually able just to contact the company and ask them to write me a letter uh, saying that it was okay that I filed a similar uh, trademark. Uh, I convinced them, they signed the letter, and we're in the process of, of, of getting that accepted, hopefully. so. Awesome. Um, Stephen, you mentioned to me that uh, you used, uh, I think, a trademark attorney that happened to be, I think, a friend on a good... Yeah. yeah, so we, we use a lot of attorneys for, for our business, but, you know, one thing that we did in our earliest days, which was really great for us, and I'd recommend other founders think about it, is if, if you just have a trusted attorney friend who believes in you, give her or him some shares of the company. Um, you know, saving cash is pretty essential in your earliest days. And so that's what I did. I, you know, an LMU graduate from, from the same class as mine, uh, she was someone I respected and great attorney. So I gave her some shares of the company, uh, not a huge amount, but enough where 
you know, she would have probably done it for free as a favor, but I wanted to compensate her. And, yeah. and that way we made sure that when we filed for trademarks, it wasn't screwed up because if I did it myself, I'd probably screw it up. Right. So or I'll do it repeatedly. <laughs> or yeah, yeah or, or, or it would have taken 10 times as long. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, you, you look for, you should work with people that are better than you and in, in their fields. Right. And so you, you look for people that you can trust. And I think, um, you know, whether that's a, a, a law firm or a friend, um, again, when you get to a certain stage, I think you want to make sure that you're doing things right. Um, and so sometimes you can depend on your friends and you got to make sure they know what they're doing. Um, cause lots of friends may not, uh, but I was fortunate to be in a position where, uh, my friends definitely knew what they were doing. I can imagine your case, if you're talking to investors to raise $15 million and you say, oh yeah, I did the trade book myself and hope it works. <laughs> that, that be Everybody appreciates hustling. I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I don't know if it would, I don't think it would have been looked down upon, but again, for our business, like we probably talked about, you know, patents or trademarks on like slide 24, right? Yeah. Like we def, you know, I, I think for, for some of, you know, for, for Letty and, and Matthew's business, my guess is it's, it's much closer to the front, right? Because it's, 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 uh, it's a meaningful protection for them. So it, it, it's great. It's good to have different perspective based on different industries so that our students don't think, oh, I have to go file patent right now. Um, you know, uh, I want to address one issue that uh, Dean Smith mentioned, the idea of open source and where if patents actually stifle innovation, and I've heard that actually in, in the life science industry, whereas in, you know, in the IT industry, there's been so much advance. And it's a lot of it because open source, you know, even if, if people file patents, engineers get together on, in the back room, they share ideas and, and you know, they freely share ideas with each other. But um, you know, in, in life science, people are very secretive and they don't want to share you know, knowledge with each other. And some people say that's why, you know, we don't have cure for cancer and, you know, things are not advancing in, in the life sciences. Anybody heard of anything like that? Any discussions along those lines? I would definitely, definitely echo what was said earlier about sharing your idea with uh, investors. I, I, I don't worry about doing that because, you know, the idea is just an idea. Execution is so important. Um, and, and investors are not in the business of starting companies. But I can see in the life sciences or any sort of, um, you know, uh, research field like that. I mean, who are you sharing your ideas with? Other people who are trying to innovate in the same spaces that you are. And they are in the business of, of doing innovations in that idea, in that realm. And the, um, you know, there are... They're like little vectors of opportunity to pursue and you can go down a road for three years and find out that that was the right road or the wrong road. And mm -hmm. if, if you can help get on the right road in the first month, you know, because you heard somebody else say, oh, that's a great idea, you know, then that can be a real competitive advantage. So I'm, I'm not so surprised that they're reluctant uh, to do that um, mm -hmm. in that space. But generally, I, especially when you're talking to investors, I think you have to speak passionately about your idea. You're only going to get that investment if you can get them to see the opportunity in your head. And if you're keeping all the best cards face down the table, they're never going to be able to see the opportunity that you see because because they don't see the good stuff. So you got to share the good stuff. Um, and like I said, they're really not in the business of competing with you. The one caveat there is is if if they have portfolio companies in your space, if they sit on the board of a competitor, you know you want to. Of course, be careful. They could just take be taking the meeting to try to learn about your business so they can share it with their, you know, competitively. But that's that's a VC with no no morals and no ethics, and so hopefully you're not talking to those folks anyway. But it doesn't mean you don't want to be cautious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to, yeah to, I, follow, to follow up on that, like yeah. there's like you know, right there's almost eight billion people in the world. Someone else has your idea. Like it's yeah. the, the law of averages. Someone else has your idea. Like you need to be like Letty and out hustle them to distribution first, right? Like, I think that's how you win for a lot of for a lot of products, right? Um, and for a lot of companies. So I, I think it's on the execution, it's on the speed, it's on the network, um, as much as it is on the idea itself. Yep, yep. Um, Faustina, you mentioned the trade secret, and uh, of course, maybe the one of the most famous trade secret is uh, the formulation for Coke, right? In general, you know, if you have a trade secret, you know, I can think of another one, like special garlic noodles or whatever. 
Um, how do you, <laughs> that's a real thing. That's a real thing. Uh, uh, how do you keep that? Because sometimes you do have to share that with your employees because they have to make it. And But how do you keep this trade secret in-house? That's a tricky one. Um, obviously, you have to restrict access to whatever the secret recipe is mm -hmm. um, and only disclose it on a need-to-know basis with your employees. And from a legal perspective, you're going, to want, you're going to want to have policies and procedures that you can point to and identify as um, being structured to protect the, the secrecy. Um, you know, I've talked with founders who have software code, for example, that was shared um, with other co-founders who left and there was no agreement in place as far as, you know, what that access would look like at that point. Um, and that becomes a real problem. So agreements isn't, you know, another thing to, to kind of have in mind um, initially when you're starting to collaborate with other people um, and, and start to put into place different measures to kind of. That's a good point on agreement. Yes, Matt. Just on that point, like what we've done, we have of course NDAs and, and mutual non-disclosure agreements with, with business partners and that kind of thing. But we have all of our employees sign a confidentiality agreement. We have all of our vendors sign, um, well, actually more than confidential agreements, inventions, inventions um, and assignments agreements. So if, they've, if they create something at our company, you know, th then it's automatically assigned to us for us to file intellectual property. But the, the teeth that we put into this for employees and for anybody who has access, you know, stock options or warrants or some other way of, of getting equity to the company, is that we say if they violate that, then all of their options, not just unvested, but everything they've invested, they vested basically can get clawed back. So, you know, it becomes a very serious thing that they have to worry about. And 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 so then they're trying to really be careful to protect what they what they what they know and who they share it with because all of most of the money they're going to make with the company is not their salary, but their equity appreciation. And if they know that that's at risk, because that's what's at risk for me as a major shareholder, right? I mean, if you ruin the value of my company, my stock's worth nothing. So you're in the same boat. That's that's a you know an important um, important thing that we that we do. Oh, that that that's a good one. You know, um, the other thing I noticed for early stage uh, startup, um, you know, they they go for funding. And then we find out they have a good, you know, software that they wrote, or they, they have a good, you know, patent that they affiliated with, and they didn't assign it to the company. Mm -hmm. So, um, what's the problem with that, Justina? Ownership is a big problem. Um, even with something like trademarks, if you don't specify the correct owner on the application, you know, what if you name an investor instead of the company, for example, that could actually jeopardize the entire trademark application, it could make it void, uh, it could cause you to lose trademark rights by invalidating the trademark, even if you did get it issued. So things like that are very easy um, to overlook when you're trying to get things on file and, and protect your brand name or your invention. Um, so assignments, like Matthew mentioned, are important for um, patents and any sort of original um, works or inventions uh, that your employees are creating. Um, but then also just being mindful when you're filing um, as well, what you're putting down on the application and, and why. Um, but even more preliminarily is just having those discussions at the outset with your team, with your co-founders about IP ownership and making sure that the understandings are consistent and, and hopefully reduced to a writing um, before you start. <laughs> I'm looking at some questions and I'm laughing, but Matt, are we going to say something? Just, just real quickly on that point. The other thing is to make sure that everybody that was involved in, in creating that innovation is named on the patent because there, I've heard horror stories, right? So some employee came up with this idea, but the CTO wrote the patent, put it in there, assigned it to the company. Three years later, the guy's like, hey, wait a minute. I did that. Here are my notes. I'm not named on the patent, and they can invalidate the patent. And that employee goes to another to a competitor. That competitor finds out, oh, you actually helped develop that, and then they send their 800 pound gorilla to go invalidate the patent just because you didn't give that person credit. 
Um, and when you, they sign out as an employee, they've already granted the rights. So there's no, there's no risk of naming them, just giving them credit. But if, there's a huge risk of not naming them because it can invalidate it later. That right. CTO story reminds me of uh, some PhD advisors uh, in, in, <laughs> in different universities. Plus, you know, you're going to say something. Oh, I was just going to say that inventorship is is a legal determination. So not everybody who, who necessarily touches the project is considered an inventor. So it's important to to start talking about that early on, um, and figure out who actually made a, a creative contribution to the invention, um, and also what is ultimately being claimed. Someone may have started off working on a project, but then whatever gets claimed, um, you know, is not part of their contribution. So they wouldn't necessarily be an inventor on that particular application. So these are tricky discussions to have, but again, like Matt said, it's important to highlight them. All right, I'm gonna go through some of the questions maybe quickly. Um, Letty, the question by Sunil here, how much time do you spend making sure no one is infringing on your trademark or patent? Um, well, I mean, the ones that I've found that infringed have usually been sent to me by someone else. Oh, or I've yeah. found them on social media. So social media was another thing I wanted to talk about earlier when you're doing your own trademark research. Social media is obviously one of the platforms you want to make sure you, you access and you look into. But um, I mean, I don't spend a whole lot of time because... If you spend all your time, you know, <laughs> uh, protecting your IP, then you're not, you know, creating other innovative products and you're not running your business. So, uh, but, uh, but I do spend some time, I, a couple hours a month and whenever something comes my way that looks interesting, then of course the focus is on there. And then I send the information to the lawyer and, you know, they do their, their side of it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question by Lucas. We actually addressed this, but I wanted to ask one more thing. So first, you know, you heard Matt's uh, suggestion about, you know, maybe finding a patent firm, law firm, not too small, not too big. Um, what do you think about the uh, size that uh, Matt mentioned? Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. I mean, I've, I've worked in IP boutiques before where we were more uh, among the size that Matt was mentioning. Um, and there's certainly benefits to that. I mean, we're big enough that we have a docketing system in place and all the resources to make sure that deadlines aren't missed because deadlines are crucial um, in IP to make sure that you don't lose rights by missing a deadline. Um, I work in a larger general practice firm now, Tucker Ellis. Um, I'm within the IP group. I will say one benefit is that when they have a client come to me, I'm able to now refer out to my colleagues for issues that are outside of IP. So that's one um, sort of side benefit. You know, I had a client in the cosmetic space. We worked on the IP. I'm doing the trademarks and pen applications for them. But they also had questions about packaging, um, labeling, things like that, regulatory compliance. And I was able to refer them to a colleague who could advise on that. Um, commercial contracts with their manufacturer. I have another colleague who can help with that. So um, that would be the one, I think, benefit to having a bigger firm. But again, if you get to a really large firm, like Matt was saying, you kind of start to lose control in that personal relationship over who's touching your cases and working on them. And so uh, I, I do agree that the midsize seems to be a good uh, kind of sweet spot. Especially you know, I've, heard, I've heard of one person using a large firm, large IP or law firm, because the company that they want to do a deal with is using that law firm. Does that make sense or not? It might. I would like to know the firm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, perhaps, I mean, there, there are obviously business reasons to use a particular firm as well, or we have existing relationships that make you know, make it make sense to go there. Um, but, you know, things like expertise and all the factors that Matt was naming are important as well. And Steve was saying, having someone you trust. Um, and Letty was saying, having someone responsive who, you know, pays attention to your concerns and gets back to you in a timely way. Those are all important factors. There's a question by Katie. I think the answer is, uh, by the way, we'll just do five minutes of this and we'll gracefully uh, end the session today. But uh, I think, I guess the answer depends on the service. The question is, is there any way to protect the service you're providing rather than a product? I guess if there's some something not something novel about the service, but then the second question is, such as a consulting service, I think there's probably nothing you can do there, having been in consulting. 
they come up with new ways of doing consulting, new topics, and usually other people don't use the same exact same words, but copy it, I think, over time. Um, so probably the answer is uh, not really, right? Um, I, I think it depends on how the service is being provided. So there are a lot of um, things that we might perceive as services like Spotify streaming service, for example, mm -hmm. they have an app and there's a lot of technology built into the app and, and they file patent applications. So um, it, it just depends on how, how the service is being provided, but there's no, um, you're not precluded from, from trying to seek IP protection just because you're a service. That's I think right. you go about it in a different way. And you could trademark a certain slogan or something yeah certainly you would trademark um whatever name is being used or word or to to provide the service yeah that's a good idea um i've heard some companies publish white papers as a way to establish some form of territory again i think probably not that effective except again you could probably uh protect certain trademarks or or something like that it may be helpful from a defensive point of view um to the extent that you know, patent examiner is looking at an application for something similar, and your white paper was published prior to that application being filed, then your white paper could potentially be cited as prior art and, and prevent that patent application from issuing. Mm -hmm. um, so, for that reason, there may be some um, maybe part of your IP strategy, but you wouldn't actually get a patent just by filing an, a, a white paper, publishing a white paper. Okay, um, whoops. <laughs> okay, this is uh, uh, close to home, Matt. If okay. Boeing came along, okay, and decided to buy or partner with you, would you consider the offer? Well, you're, you're assuming we're not already having that conversation with <laughs> Boeing and others. But um, yeah, uh, you know, that... Um, in all sincerity, we're, we, we've had, we've had lots of that, those kinds of uh, approaches to our company. So, um, you know, I, I've had six public company exits. I think three of them were sales to public company exits. So I'm, um, I'm not adverse to it. I, we're not running the company to sell it, uh, to flip it or anything like that. I would like nothing better than to be running this company 20 years from now. Um, you know, that said, you know, if, if you're, if you're successful and you're executing and, you know, somebody, a huge company like Boeing or Airbus or Lockheed or Northrop Grumman or, you know, Raytheon, like one of those companies, you know, can take your technology and implement it in a bigger way, faster across a broader spectrum and have all these economies of scale, like all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it becomes more valuable to them than it is even to you because all the value to you at a, at a growing company is, is about potential and they can like plug it right in. It's like, well, we got to, you know, I, in our space, there's this thing in the Army Futures Command called Future Vertical Lift, which is to replace Apache, V-22, Chinook, um, you know, uh, those Black Hawk, those helicopters with, with, it's, with other aircraft. And it's a 60 to $90 billion opportunity. And the people are, you know, we're having lots of conversations about using the transwing in that capacity. And so those are all those big companies that are involved in that. Bell, Boeing, Sikorsky, Lockheed, and whatnot. So um, long way of saying we would consider anything, but I, I think my eyes are a lot bigger than theirs right now. So I'm not sure we would meet on the, on the, on the price. But we are actively teamed with several of the largest defense companies in the world on different projects. And so we're, we're dancing a lot and, um, and moving forward with projects with DARPA, with IARPA, with the Air Force, with the Navy, um, and, and a bunch of stuff on the commercial side, too. We're partnered with one of the largest shipping companies in the world to, for maritime uh, logistics deliveries to the 98,000-plus commercial shipping vessels out there. So there's a lot, of, um, a lot of good stuff and a lot of good conversations, but we're not angling for that. Matt, is this your 17th or 18th company? What, what, what number is it? If you go all the way back to take it to the curb, which was, you know, in ninth grade, taking people's trash cans. Yeah, that's the number. But um, probably 14 since I graduated from LMU. Oh, only 14. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's not necessarily a good thing, right? No. Well, uh, I, I, I think you finally, uh, finally found a good one. <laughs> yes, I think so. We've had a, a, few, a few lucky ones. Well, you know, with these uh, scientific technological inventions, sometimes it takes a while to commercialize, but, you know, it, it really feels good, I think. 
based on what I try to do and what I've heard to actually get your product out there and see it actually working, especially in, in a large, significant way. So uh, I hope that happens in one way or another. And uh, um, I mean, Letty and Steve, you're, yours too, in your case too, right? Don't, don't you just love seeing your product you, you know, out being used in the marketplace? Do we love it? Yeah, <laughs> yes. Of course, of course. I, I mean, I remember the the first day it, it, it hit social media and I can remember the comments, like this is a life-changing tool. Where, where has it been on my life? And those comments still get to me when I see it on social media and when I see it on the store shelves. Even when I see the copycats at, at a <laughs> the CBS, I... You know, yeah. it hurts, but at the same time, it feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, when, when you told me you were at work and your phone started vibrating with all these comments on, on social media. You're very emotional. Yes. Steve. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's thrilling, right? I think it's thrilling for, for any startup or any company to see their, their stuff in the wild. Uh, I think, you know, for us, you know, we, uh, some of our products have been advertised during Sunday night football or during the English Premier League. Oh, yeah, I remember, I remember. I, remember. Like, that, that, I saw it, I saw it. And I thought, what the heck? I saw that, actually, it was recent. Yeah, yeah and it's great. I mean, especially yeah. if, if you're, you know, if you're a young engineer right out of college and, you know, that's why you join a company like ours as opposed to Google, right? Because if you work at Google, your code may never even see the light of day. But mm -hmm. with a company like ours, you have a chance to actually build a product that is played by millions. And so, um so yeah, it, it's always a pretty thrilling, thrilling thing when that happens. Oh, and then I, I saw one of the questions I'd love to just give my input on. Yes, please. Someone was asking about, you know, if you have a provisional patent, do you still need an NDA when talking to engineers, investors, et cetera? Um, you know, we certainly do sign a lot of NDAs when it talks to partners or potential consultants. Like, I don't think there's anything wrong with requesting a you know, mutual NDA mm -hmm. uh, just for that level of protection. Um, I... I'm of the opinion that I would advise against it for investors. Um, yeah. Raising money is just very hard. It's very hard for everyone. I, again, if you look at the distribution of capital, you know, it's not very diverse. And so if you're from an underrepresented uh, group, it's even harder. I think the last thing you want to do is add unnecessary hurdles. And so asking investors to sign an NDA before you share stuff with them, um, yeah. you'll, you'll lower your, your, your bucket. So I would definitely strongly advise against that. I think we've, we've been a company now seven years. Um, just this past year, we've, we've started to introduce some NDAs for investors because we're protecting our partner information in terms of how much we charge them. But for the first six years, we didn't do it at all. Um, and I, I don't know if we could have raised any money if we had done it. So I oh, think- A lot, lot of in investors refuse, you know, refuse yeah. to sign NDAs for a variety of reasons. So uh, yeah, you'd really limit the number of investors you can talk to as an early stage company if you ask for an NDA to be signed by investors it's scary to put your idea out there but in some ways i think you just have to you have to do it and you know hope that you can go faster and out execute um others all right you know i think time's up and i want to really really truly thank our panelists uh you've been great uh you have great companies you're doing great work and Taking your, you took your very busy time, time out of your schedule, busy schedule, and shared your um, expertise with us. Uh, we had awesome attendance today, um, and you know I think this is one of the best attended events. Surprise! Who knew people care about IP? So uh, I want to really thank you for being here, making it fun, participating, and I wish you all a lots of lots of luck and success in your business. And Matt, when you reach your four trillion number, let's uh, let's party, okay? <laughs> For all of us, okay. Make sure to invite all of us um, to the four trillion dollar party. Sounds good, yeah. Professor Pack. Okay, David, thank you so much for moderating such an enlightening and intriguing panel discussion. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Before we close this webinar, actually, that day, I'd like to ask uh, my own question, if you do not mind. I used to teach uh, Case, the story about the small American company um, losing a lot of potential profit in Japanese market. Because at the time that we had our first to invent and Japan had, well, first to file system. So they didn't file their technology or pattern. And one 
big Japanese conglomerate called the Mitsubishi, they purchased the product from the market and reverse engineered and flooded with, uh, you know, Twig products. So they eventually has to force out of Japanese market. Now that we changed the patent system from, um, you know, to force the inventor to file, we no longer have this kind of issue, Faustina. All the American companies, they understand what's the first thing they have to do in order to protect their IP and succeed in overseas market. Because Matt mentioned that the idea of that fat patent family. I thought it was very interesting to try to preempt that kind of uh, move, right? By the foreign companies when you're operating in a different environment. So I'm just curious about that. You know, can you do some kind of reality check? A lot of American companies now very much familiar with this and our patent system is uh, compatible with rest of the world. So no longer this is an issue. Yes, well, hopefully, I mean, the uh, America Invents Act went into effect in 2013, and that's when you started to see the change in the law. It used to be prior to 2013, we could swear behind a reference by showing, you know, we pull out the notes from the inventor and say, we, our inventor uh, conceived of this idea first. Um, but now I think that we've kind of been living with the AIA for this many years. I think it's very much, um, hopefully, ingrained in sort of the, the, the minds of the public now that we are a first to file system and that's brought us into conformity with the way most of the world was operating um, in terms of their patent system. So um, early filing is important, um, especially if you know, you're concerned, if you're going talking with investors or whomever and you don't have an NDA in place, having a provisional patent application on file is one way to kind of at least feel that you've done something to protect your filing date um, at the outset. And then, you know, like Matt said, file different uh, family members within your, your patent portfolio to try to um, take advantage of different aspects of your invention um, to the extent that you can so that you're not falling into that trap of, you know, filing too late. Um, and form filing as well is important. Great. Um, thank you so much again, the lady, Matthew, Faustina, and Stefan. Uh, for your sharing your thoughts and insights with us about this timely and important topic today. Above all, I also would like to thank all of you who joined this webinar today. I hope you have, I'm sure that you enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in April. Until then, please stay safe and healthy.